Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. We at The History Guy are also excited to announce a new way to interact with the team and The History Guy himself at Locals.com. Join The History Guy Guild for your one-stop location to chat with other history fans, get updates on the team, and more. You can join for free or pay as little as $5 a month to get access to live chats with The History Guy, looks behind the scenes, early access to ad-free videos, and more. Find us at thehistoryguyguild.locals.com. We look forward to seeing you there. On today's episode, the History Guy tells the stories of two of America's most famous foods, hot dogs and ketchup. First, he talks about how a method of food preservation has become a staple at American barbecues, and then he tells the long and winding tale of how ketchup went from being made of fish guts to Heinz 57. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. It's not quite officially summer, but the Memorial Day weekend represents the beginning of the summer season for many Americans, and that means many things, like backyard barbecues and ball games, and both of those, of course, mean hot dogs. According to the National Hot Dog and Sausage Council, and yes, there's a National Hot Dog and Sausage Council, Americans will consume some 20 billion hot dogs this year, roughly 70 each. The history of the hot dog goes back a lot farther than you might think, and how it becomes such an American icon with an almost disturbing number of regional varieties is intimately linked to American culture and history. Whether you like them boiled or grilled, with chili or sauerkraut or mustard or, blasphemy to some, ketchup, the history of the hot dog is a history of modern America. Sausage making, the process where ground meat, usually along with salt and spices, is pressed into a casing, traditionally animal intestine, is an efficient means of preserving food, especially scraps that otherwise might be hard to cook or serve. Sausages were preserved by various means, cured, dried, or smoked, although some were made without any method of preservation and would have been cooked or consumed immediately. It's unclear when sausage was invented. In his 2009 book Hot Dog, A Global History, Food historian Dr. Bruce Craig notes that the first chopped or processed meat encased in gut was the ancestral sausage. He argues that archaeological evidence suggests this kind of food dates as far back as the Upper Paleolithic era, some 20,000 years ago. Sausages were certainly a part of culture in antiquity. A 1999 article in the journal Greek, Roman, and Byzantine Studies called Sausage and Meat Preservation in Antiquity remarks to salt mince meat and fat and stuff it into casings was a convenient way to give leftovers some shelf life. It also had the advantage of concealing from the squeamish exactly what the contents were. A 1985 article in the journal Biblical Archaeologist notes that a brief satirical text reveals that the Mesopotamians knew how to fill intestines with a force meat of some kind, prompting the authors to ask, is it too much to credit these people with the earliest form of sausage? If so, then it isn't clear what kind of meat was used or how it was preserved, but the text, written in cuneiform, suggests that some version of sausage was being produced as much as 5,000 years ago. A Greek comedy written by Epicharmus of Kos approximately 2,600 years ago called The Aurea is sometimes literally translated as The Sausage, although the text of the play has been lost. Sausage is frequently referenced in Greek and Roman works, including in Homer's Odyssey. In fact, the etymology of the modern word sausage traces back to an archaic Latin word meaning seasoned with salt. As to the nature of sausage in antiquity, Greek, Roman, and Byzantine studies speculates from how sausage is discussed in Greek and Roman literature that we conclude that sausage must have been a cheap and common snack for the crowds coming and going into the city, and that from time immemorial, sausages were made of the cheapest leftovers and were easy to adulterate. They note that one text implied that the sausage maker mixes dog and donkey meat into his sausages, but the author also speculates that pork would have been the most common meat used. And while sausage might have been a common food made from the cheapest leftovers, recipes are recorded in ancient texts that were intended as haute cuisine for the wealthy. A cookbook by the Roman gourmet Apicius, which was thought to have been compiled around 500 AD, included a recipe for brain sausage. In the mortar put pepper, lovage, and origany, 
moisten with broth and rub. Add cooked brains and mix diligently until there be no lumps. Sausage was a common food in medieval Europe for both high and low classes, and many recipes still exist. Sausages were most often but not exclusively made from pork and were a means of preserving meat through winter. Recipes for sausages are also found in this area in China. Some recipes incorporated grains or fruits as well. Haggis, presumed to have originated in Scotland, although similar dishes were found elsewhere and date back to ancient times, combines cooked, ground sheep, heart, lungs, and liver with oatmeal and suet. And the traditional casing is a sheep's bladder. In the Americas, pemmican is made of dried meat combined with fat and sometimes dried fruit. In Europe, German culture especially developed sausage. A blog post on the website of E Fresh Meals explains that sausage was a means of survival for Germans during the winter months. Germany was particularly suited to sausage making because it has mountainous regions where the drier northern winds helped in the curing process. Moreover, in warmer European countries, food was more available, so sausage making never became as popular. By the 14th century, recipes for bratwurst started to appear in Germany, although there is a disagreement whether the food originated in Franconia or Thuringia. And some even argued originated earlier with the Celts. There are many regional styles of bratwurst, which might be made with beef, pork, veal, or a mix of any of the three. Bratwurst tends to use coarsely ground meat, and typically the lengths of sausage are relatively thick and long. Thus, bratwurst adds texture to meals, and its size means that it is a significant part of a meal. This contrasts with the Frankfurter. As the name implies, the city of Frankfurt claims to have invented this type of sausage. They date the invention to the year 1487, and in 1987 celebrated the 500th birthday of its introduction. Thus, this traditional American dish was invented five years ahead of Columbus's discovery of the Americas. However, CNN noted in a July 2020 story that hot dog historians argue that sausage culture, native to Eastern Europe and particularly Germany, has no specific town of origin. Frankfurters, or wieners, differ from bratwurst. They are smaller, thinner, and have a smoother skin than bratwurst. Originally made from pork or pork and beef mixtures, they are slow cooked or smoked and flavored, usually with coriander. Whereas bratwurst is coarse and adds texture, the meat of a frankfurter is more finely ground and the texture smooth. Craig explains that these types of sausages came to the United States from immigrants in the mid and late 19th century. He rejects the idea that the U.S. hot dog life was tied, however, to a specific inventor or region. Rather, he notes that several sausage traditions have influenced the modern American hot dog. Sausage vendors could be found in places like markets and fair throughout Europe from the Middle Ages to the present. Naturally, immigrants took their food traditions with them, and it is these sausages, particularly the German ones, that became the American hot dog. But notably, Craig points out that the hot dog, as it is known today, is the result of processing technology that was developed during the 19th century, becoming, he says, an emulsified food. And thus, he says, the hot dog has a cultural and social history all its own. The German tradition of selling sausages at public events like fairs and markets fit with the American culture in the city, and, and vendors began selling sausages from push carts wherever Germans immigrated. Such carts might have been around as early as the 1840s, but Craig observed certainly by the 1860s. Such carts became particularly popular in the bustling streets of New York City. Seen in travel quotes Coney Island historian Michael Quinn. The advantage of having a hot sausage on an elongated bun is a very New York thing. New Yorkers like to walk and eat. It was there that an entrepreneur named Charles Feltman would help to popularize the Frankfurter sausage. Born in 1851, Feltman had immigrated to the United States in 1856. In 1867, he began operating a pushcart wagon selling food to beachgoers at New York City's Coney Island. According to a pamphlet on Coney Island food published in 1997, in 1867, Charles Feltman owned a pie wagon that delivered his freshly baked pies to the inns and lager beer saloons that lined Coney Island's beaches. His clients also wanted hot sandwiches to serve to their customers, but his wagon was small and he knew it would be hard to manage making a variety of sandwiches in a confined space. He thought that perhaps something simple, like a hot sausage served on a roll, might be the solution. He presented his problem to Donovan, the wheelwright at East New York and Howard Street in Brooklyn, who had built his pie wagon. The man saw no problem in building a tin-lined chest to keep the rolls fresh and rigging a small charcoal stove inside to boil sausages. Their sausages and easily held buns became very popular, as New York historian Henry Collins Brown wrote in his 1928 book In the Golden Nineties. It could be carried on the barge, eaten on the sands between baths, consumed on a carousel, used as a baby's nipple to quiet an obstreperous infant, and had other economic appeals to the summer pleasure seeker. 
Eventually, Feltman built a restaurant complex that helped to popularize both the food and Coney Island as an entertainment area. CNN Travel wrote in 2020, In 1875, Feltman convinced president of the Prospect Park Railroad, Andrew Culver, to run the subway line down to Coney Island, offering public transportation to thousands of New Yorkers who had never before had access to the far reaches of Brooklyn. But it was actually a former employee turned competitor who would have the biggest influence on the connection between hot dogs and Coney Island. Nathan Handworker was a Polish immigrant who worked for Feltman as a bun slicer. When he left to start his own business in 1916, he undersold Feltman, selling his sausages for five cents when Feltman charged ten. Handworker sausages became the more popular of the two, and his restaurant, Nathan's Famous, became a Coney Island landmark. Another important point in the history of the hot dog, according to the National Hot Dog and Sausage Council, was during the year 1893, as the convenient and inexpensive food was sold at the World Columbian Exposition in Chicago, where its popularity helped to establish it as a staple American food. Also in 1893, Christopher Vanderai, owner of the St. Louis professional baseball team, the Brown Stockings, started selling hot dogs at games. In 1882, Vanderai purchased the bankrupt team, which had been rocked by a game-fixing scandal for just $1,800. A saloon owner, he expected to earn his money back not just through ticket sales, but from the sales of beer. Eventually, he surrounded his ballpark with an amusement park, racetrack, and beer garden. While it's difficult to document, he is generally credited with being the first to sell Frankfurter sausages at baseball games, founding the connection between America's iconic food and its iconic sport. 1893 also represented another watershed for the convenient food, as that is, according to Craig, the first time the name hot dog was known to have been used in print to refer to the sausage. The Knoxville Journal wrote, even the Wienerverse men were preparing the hot dogs for sale Saturday night. Previously, the food had gone by several names, Frankfurters, Wieners, Red Hots, Vienna Sausages. The connection to dogs had actually already been made, as the long, thin sausage bore a passing resemblance to the small German dog breed, the Dachshund, which had been imported to America nearly the same time and by the same immigrants as the sausages. Thus, early on, they were often called a Dachshund Sausage. There are numerous legends about how the food got its more popular name. In one, the name was supposedly coined by a sports cartoonist for the New York Journal named Tad Dorgan. According to the legend, in 1901, he saw vendors selling docks and sausages at New York's Polo Ground Stadium. He drew a cartoon depicting little dogs in buns, but unsure of how to spell dachshund, he instead called them hot dogs. However, the story is doubtful. Craig notes that the supposed comic has never been found, and as the Knoxville Journal demonstrated, the term was in use prior to the time when that cartoon was supposed to have been drawn. Another legend, printed in a 1924 edition of the Brooklyn Standard Union, suggests that the term was coined on Coney Island, but in the 1600s, when island natives, possibly Iroquois, served Henry Hudson a traditional feast of a cooked fat dog. It's a pretty safe bet, the paper writes, that at this feast, the phrase hot dog was coined. The story appears to be tongue-in-cheek, but the paper did note that the hot dog of today is wildly different than that of several hundred years ago. Instead of these explanations, King contends that the name began around college campuses in the 1890s, where vendor carts were commonly called dog stands. It might have been partially derived from the resemblance to the dachshund, but following the American sense of humor, the term hot dog also likely referenced the dubious provenance of the meat inside the casing. The name did take some time, however, to become universally accepted. A 1923 edition of the Kansas City Star explains that, when asked, vendors of the treat objected, preferring the name Frankfurter or Coney Islands. The name Hot Dogs, they complained, was a gross libel on the dependable cow and hog and on the dependable sturdy Frankfurter. Another hot dog myth has to do with the bun. One popular story says that in 1904, a Bavarian concessionaire named Aaron Fuchwager sold hot dogs at the St. Louis Exposition. He would give each person a white glove to hold the hot sausage, but the gloves often were not returned. Thus, he started selling them in convenient buns, which proved very popular. Again, the myth simply doesn't meet reality. Sausages and buns are being sold at Coney Island at least a decade ahead of 1904. In fact, Craig notes that Germans traditionally ate the sausages on bread and that the tradition simply came along with the sausage. While there are many legends about the development of what is possibly America's most iconic food, food historians tell us that hot dogs were not the product of a single inventor or entrepreneur, but rather were brought here by immigrants from many places. It became particularly popular in the bustling late 19th century and early 20th century America because they were convenient and inexpensive because of industrial production. 
Over time, hot dogs have developed several regional styles, from the familiar New York dog with mustard and sauerkraut or grilled onions to the Chicago style with fresh tomato, pickles, onions, and relish. The reason fans of Chicago dogs so abhor ketchup is that the tart flavor is provided by the fresh tomatoes and the sweet flavor from the relish. Detroit-style dogs are served with a beef chili, and San Francisco's are wrapped in smoky bacon. In fact, there are nearly as many styles of hot dogs as there are cities in which they are served. One persistent question about hot dogs is the conundrum that hot dogs are usually sold in packs of 10, while hot dog buns are sold in packs of 8. California news station KSBY explains that buns are usually baked in clusters of four pans designed to hold eight rolls, while hot dogs are sold in packs of 10 because 10 hot dogs is roughly one pound. Despite their history of dubious ingredients, hot dogs in the U.S. today are regulated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Food and Drug Administration. The type of protein used must be clearly labeled. While sausages made with offal, such as lips and cheeks, are still made, those are usually made in local shops. Such items will be labeled as variety meats. Whether boiled or grilled, there's a good chance that hot dogs will be on your menu this summer. The Hot Dog and Sausage Council estimates that hot dogs are served in 70% of American homes. And the humble sausage that is such a part of history is now a part of backyard barbecues and picnics, county fairs, and nights at the ballpark. All those moments of life that deserve to be remembered. Now's the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. A little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind-the-scenes stuff you only get to hear about on the podcast. I'd also like to welcome back to the podcast my grandma and the history guy's mother, Betty Jo. So I think that uh, we can think of hot dogs as just a, a classic piece of American culinary tradition, um, if not the fanciest. Uh, they're especially common in the summer, which is why I thought it was a good a good day to do this, because we'll be just after Memorial Day, and that's a day where you you cook up the hot dogs. And I think you know the first thing that uh, shocked me about this is that sausage is prehistoric. Uh, well, yeah, it's a, you know sausage is a way that you can preserve uh, meat, uh, and it's also a way that you can uh, deal with scraps and opal and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean it's not really a surprise if you think about it. But Why, the one, you know, one of the first things you do is just take the leftover stuff and kind of squeeze it together. One of the things that surprises me is that it, that it basically is a, that a hot dog is a sausage, because that's not the way I think of those as two different uh, things totally. Yeah, you know, I, I thought about it that way, too, is that these are uh, the, certainly like, you know, when you get sausage on pizza, it's, it doesn't even look like anything that you would call sausage in, <laughs> in this. Uh, but it's it's very much, you know, we think of these hot dogs as uh, as as something kind of unique. And it's interesting that they're they're really the same thing. It's just yeah, just slightly it's just different. a very lame sausage. It is such an Americanized <laughs> version of a sausage. You essentially take ground bologna and call it sausage. Yeah. Yes. Well, and, and, and uh, when you watch the video, then you're really glad that we could. We got down to use putting it in the hot dogs because some of the things they stuffed in the old days didn't sound very appetizing. It's it's really remarkable how that kind of how those traditions kind of begin, and that's you know that's what we see here is we see that they were doing it all over the place, uh, but it, there, there's a shift from I think when it's just uh, you know a way to preserve food, which of course it remains no matter what, mm -hmm. but then when it turns into like a piece of uh, culture, yeah, and it's not just in so many styles and cuisines, in so many different ways. Some of it's dried, some of it's smoked, uh, some yeah. of it you you know you cook it from, and uh, and so I mean really what sets apart? I mean it is a sausage. What sets it apart though is that it is ground so smooth uh, that it's all this smooth consistency inside, and you know we're used to sausage having you know texture in it. So, yeah. uh, but I mean it's it is just another form of sausage that developed over time and it turned out uh, uh, that a number of immigrant cultures carried it to the u.s because it was ubiquitous enough that people coming from all over europe had the had the tradition uh, and so this it's interesting because we don't really know how it you know exactly came to the u.s because so many people brought it here so if we want to think of like you said from the start if we want to think of hot dogs as being like lame american sausages actually uh, these this was something that was popular enough over a wide enough area that uh, that it was carried here as a tradition by a number of different people so there's something about homogenizing the meat. There's something about making it all smooth so that you, you know, there's something that you know many people share. But the neat thing is too, then how it became such a tradition for at the ball at at the baseball game or so forth. Yeah. And of course, uh, hot dogs made the news this week because they changed the they changed the name of the Wienermobile. Oh, that's right. Uh, and so uh, so they showed that on on TV all week, uh, talking that they had changed it into the what the Frank Frank something or other. So like everything else, we're going to change the name just a little bit. 
But I thought that was interesting when I found out we were doing hot dogs because all of a sudden, then if you see one of the of the mobiles going down the street, it has a different name now. It's Santa Claus. <laughs> Even though it's uh, well, I, what are they just trying to not be made fun of because it's the Wiener Mobile? Is I the, don't know. I think it's just a marketing <laughs> thing. And, yeah. and the, the only change to it is changing the name name on the side. The vehicle is the same vehicle. I mean, so I mean, but. No, basically, uh, uh, no. You and I both know they did it for, uh, for publicity. Uh, they were on they were on the news this week because uh, I I did a uh, a survey and they were asking if you've seen anything advertised and so forth and I could say yes I saw the Wiener Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> That's their whole goal is to get it talked about. Well, you know that makes sense and they they here here we are talking about it here so they win. <laughs> I suppose I, you know I thought it was you know talking about it at the at the baseball games. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting that it was probably you know a kind of cheap street food sausage. Yeah. Um, even back in you know Greek and Roman times. Yeah, so always was always was. It's simple. You're using you know you're using the lowest quality meat because you're not even using it as a cut, uh, and yeah. it's it's convenient as street food. I mean that's the whole idea. Is it's it's you know good. I mean in in America it came because as a sandwich you only had to have you you didn't have to have a grill or anything. You just had to boil water. Yeah. Uh, so you could, you know, whatever the guy would add a pie wagon. And so this was something could fit on the cart and cook these hot sandwiches without having to, you know, try to have some sort of big, you know, display for all what you're going to do with the sandwich. And then that that leads to all the, the hot dog traditions in America, which is fascinating. Everybody then puts different stuff on the on the hot dogs. But yeah, the same reason it was popular in Rome is the same reason it was popular in the United States, uh, because it was uh, it was an inexpensive meat and it was easy yeah. to keep and to serve and to eat. And then you and then you start a whole new industry. You have to make buns to fit it, yep. and uh, and so. But apparently, there's very definitely rules about what you can and can't put on. Uh, oh my gosh! Yes, yes. As far as condiments, yeah. uh, in different places, uh, and I hadn't realized until watching the video again that they say that uh, ketchup is forbidden. In oh some my places. goodness! Yes, in Illinois, in Chicago, the Chicago style dog, that is sacrilege to put ketchup on a hot dog. That is anything else. They don't care. But you cannot put ketchup on a hot dog, and it's it's yeah, a big deal. If you talk to people dog. from Illinois, that is uh, that is well, I mean, not everybody from Illinois, I think, cares, but that is that's like a big deal. That's like that's like the <laughs> that's difference. The... That's like the Cubs and the Sox. Uh, that is that is uh, 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 ketchup on a hot dog. You can't you can't do. You know, it's and, and I've I've known that rule, but I also think that uh, there's. There's got to be a lot of people who are eating ketchup on hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, though, too, is that the the sweet, the ketchup adds to the sweet, is is done with uh, with uh, relish instead of yeah. of ketchup. But so I don't know why that's such a big deal. And honestly, I think if you went to a vendor in, in Chicago and asked for ketchup, they're probably not going to not sell you a hot dog, right? Uh, but also, I mentioned because there, if you if you look at if you look by city, like there's Detroit style hot dogs. I had some people comment on the video saying, "I've lived in Detroit my whole life, never heard of a Detroit style hot dog." But if you look up like Detroit style hot dog, they're like, so, I mean, that's, you know, it's a sales technique too. Yeah. You're just trying to make yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, Detroit style hot dog is a Cody dog, but the chili has no beans. That's the key to it. Interesting. That's the, that's their big thing. All is meat the, chili no is on your hot dog. That's the, you know, everyone's got to have one. And I mean, I think that speaks to the, the versatility of the, of the hot dog as a, as a. It is. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's, a, it's, it's succeeded. It grew because you went to the World Fair and you found out this is a really easy way to serve a hot sandwich, and it's very convenient and very yeah. easy. Yep. Yeah, it's not. It's not especially messy. It's you can eat it with one hand, and you can cook it so they're... easy. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's uh, almost anybody will like it because it, I mean, because it's 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 homogenized. I mean, that's why kids yeah. like it, etc. Because you know, kids are not used to textures and and, and strong yeah. flavors. And... Yeah, they'll eat. They'll eat the. The hot dogs but you know i thought it was funny too that even back in greek and roman times it had a reputation for who knows what's inside of this yeah. <laughs> and we still you know it's, it's regulated today i mean i don't think you get yeah. a mouse inside your hot dog but uh yeah i mean that's all uh, you know the, and uh, uh uh upton sinclair the jungle was originally talking about sausage making we still say you know if you want to say something's difficult or you don't want to see it you say it's like sausage making uh, but yeah, it is. You are taking the leftover meat. I mean, if you could cut that into a piece of meat that you would grill, then you would. <laughs> the, yeah, once you, right. once you is, cut the other stuff joke. off and you know grind it up, that's what that's what you know sausage has always been, and uh, hot dogs particularly because they're, it's ground so fine uh, that yeah. Uh, yeah. So you don't you don't always want to know what's inside a hot dog. I guess is what they you know, they'll say. You certainly can't tell looking at it what's inside of that, yes. which I think is a part of it's really easy for your imagination to be like, man, you really could have ground anything into this. Yeah, thing. You, you have to trust <laughs> in the regulation that it is what they say it is. Yeah. But the one thing about it, I don't think you do you ever eat a hot dog that tasted different than another hot dog, other than the fact that some of them are beef and, you know, they, and they advertise it as beef. The rest of the hot dogs are always the same. 
Yeah, it's, there's a pretty homogenized uh, the recipe hot dog a, flavor. The recipe works. <laughs> it does just fine. You know, I think that it's uh, interesting too. Is that there? There were very specific words for you know what kinds of. So I mean, I you know I always knew, and I, I like bratwurst a lot, but it's not a hot dog or a, or you know a frankenfurter, frank frankfurter, uh, because they're. Uh, invent you know those the, there were specific ways in how you would prepare it and i think that's kind of interesting that you know it's a specialized uh kind of activity about what kinds of sausage we're going to have when it's really just the one food but yeah, yeah. i mean uh, i mean they all have but i mean there are lots of different sausages made from different meats and different spices true. and, and, and etc and you know in theory uh people will tell you that there's a difference between a hot dog and a wiener and a frank uh, and yeah. but, but uh you know i i think that actually the same product is probably sold under all you know all three names uh, yeah, I wonder what the, I wonder, there might not be any rules on, on what you call it. Yeah, I'm not sure know. if that's, I mean, I think a Frankfurter is supposed to be pork, is that right? I'm not to, too sure. Uh, uh, yeah. And, yeah, but I, I don't mean, usually it, look, look but at it, this. Because they talk about a hot dog being American food, which of course, like all the, those American foods, it came from Europe, it wasn't yeah. an American food. But as it became a tradition, it really was an American tradition. And, and so yeah. the, the cool part about it is not just that we eat this, this sort of bland sausage. Uh, I make it sound bad. I like hot dogs, but oh, uh, I do too. but uh, but it's it, the the other thing is just how that sort of you know became attached to just how we you know Fourth of July fireworks and county fairs yeah. and uh, and uh, and the baseball games of course it became associated with baseball games and things like that. NASCAR. That's just part of American uh, grilling outside. That's all part of how you do American history and hot dogs became attached to that. And so when they say you know hot dogs, baseball, apple pie, and, and Chevrolet. Uh, 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 which we've done videos on all of those, haven't we? But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that it, it really is just, uh, it's just, it goes along with so many things that yeah. we do that we think of being quintessentially American. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting. Uh, 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 Eleanor Roosevelt was, you know, considered, she was, uh, you know, someone who, uh, who uh, she was considered to be like this very down to earth uh, first lady uh, compared to all the other first ladies. And when the King and Queen of England came to the United States, she served them hot dogs at the, at the White House. And as you know, as this, I mean, this is what it is to be yeah. quintessentially American, which I'm sure they found rather exotic. <laughs> you know, I'm sure they did, even though there were, I'm sure there were some comments of, oh, wow, that's kind of trashy. <laughs> Serving royalty hot dogs, are you? Yeah, here we probably, you know, we probably thought that was disgusting. But I mean, her, her idea is to say, you know, the reason, you know, what you serve at the state dinner is what really represents your, your culture. Yeah. Well, and certainly, you know, uh, uh, a barbecue, a good old summer barbecue, you have your burgers, you got your hot dogs. That's a very... Yeah. Uh, that's that is quintessentially American, and I think all over the country, uh, people would say you know that they, they have memories of that, or that's something people do. Especially you know, as we happen to be right here at the beginning of summer, mm -hmm. before the before the official beginning, but as as weather is warmer, you know, this is when people start breaking those things out. I also liked that I liked the connection to Coney Island. I knew, I mean, I knew a little bit because like when you go to Sonic, they still call them Coney's, mm -hmm. right? That's the it's. I think it's more rare these days. You don't see that quite as often. Uh, which probably again has a term that specifically so the, uh, those a and w kind of coney dog had chili on it that was mm -hmm. that's what made it a coney yeah. dog chili and onions is i think what they call a coney dog but yeah they call it because it was one of the first thing. places and of course that was you know this is uh the middle class is growing people have the time expendable time and money uh and that was a you know a quick easy food to eat i mean yeah. it was, you know started out because he was selling pies and he needed you know something he could fit on the cart with pies and you, it's pretty easy to put a, a burner that just boils water uh, and 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 that you know again it was it was kind of how Americans were living our lifestyle that hot dogs yeah. just kind of fit with that. Uh, and yeah, yeah, it's it really grew very uh, organically and mm -hmm. how it was going to work in this country. And it's amazing that I mean people eat sausage and I'm sure they eat hot dogs elsewhere, uh, but it's the way that we do it. You know, in America, that was a specific a specific to you know this location and the time period, mm -hmm. and we've continued to do it for for all these years. And I, I think that's special and it's something we we don't always think about. You get the you get a lot of this stuff where you know oh Americans don't have culture or whatever. And it's like, oh, you got something. <laughs> I'm, not, <laughs> you can find I'm not sure if the response when they say Americans don't have culture is we got hot dogs. <laughs> but look, hot dogs. We, but we it's not just hot dogs, right? It's Chicago dogs and, that's and true. Detroit dogs and that's and, and there are how, people who go travel around trying to trying to you know get them all. And it, you know there is yeah. uh, you know you got to pick the right vendor. You know they say look for the one that doesn't have cigarette butts floating in the water. But if you you know a hot dog out of a cart. Uh, in New York is truly a a, new, a a U.S. experience. Yeah, yeah, and it would be it wouldn't be the same anywhere else. So one of the other things you mentioned, you talked about how uh, why we have not enough buns to go with the, the hot dogs. <laughs> and while I understand why they why they you know why 
I understand it. I still feel like with today's technology, <laughs> we could probably figure it out. <laughs> we could solve that. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think... it always seems like it's a marketing thing because you either have to buy an extra package of hot dogs or an extra package of buns. You're always short of one, so yeah. you've got a constant process going. Uh, that, that wasn't the intent, but it is. I mean, the interesting part of that is that uh, the the evolution of hot dogs and the evolution of hot dog buns was not going at the same time. And, yeah. and so they came from different traditions, different reasons that we did it. And so it ends up now that you've got this weird thing where there's two more hot dogs in your package and there are buns in your package. And that's that's uh, it, it, it shows you that food has a history. Yeah. You know, this didn't just appear out yeah. of nowhere. It, this this developed over time. Uh, it de developed through traditions. Uh, and those the, it's kind of funny how they don't match. But I agree with you. I mean, I, you know, Presumably, you could shake the whole bun world by producing a package of buns that matches the size of a package of hot dogs. There's, there's got to be someone out there who's doing that. <laughs> I just, I feel like how hard can it be to add? I, I feel, I feel like someone somewhere has got that figured out. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so, what have you been watching on Magellan TV? Well, you know, uh, as everybody knows, Betty Jo is here. My mom is in town. And, and so we enjoy watching Magellan together. Uh, and uh, it's one of the, you know, we enjoy a lot of things. But I got my love of history from somewhere, you know. Uh, so we went to Magellan and we were digging around. And we, the one we watched is called The Enigma of the Celtic Tomb. Uh, and it's talking about uh, uh, archaeology, which I think is interesting, and history. We've done a lot of videos talking about the Celts because they're you know, very interesting peoples. This is about some archaeology where they found specifically three or four tombs that they, they think belong to Celtic princes. Uh, and uh, it's, it's fascinating for a number of reasons, not just what it says about Celtic culture, but also that they're finding stuff in these tombs that comes from all over the, the Mediterranean world. And we're learning quite a lot about what happened from these. And one of the things that was absolutely fascinating is one of the, the main mounds that they dug into, and, and uh, but it was a woman, uh, uh, and it, uh, a very, very uh, nice looking. Uh, it shows a sculpture of her, but supposedly, or from everything that they can tell, she was the one that was in charge. She was the queen bee, and that was not that was not something that I was quite expecting. And the other thing is, there's, there's so much more there to learn. It looks like uh, uh, you know this is really. This really is a mystery and a mystery that we don't know, it, that we're just figuring out. It's interesting. It's spread across multiple museums. I don't think it's probably well known here in the United States that they found these. And they're talking you know, to multiple people over multiple sites to make conclusions. So, so you, it really gets you a vision that you kind of, it would be difficult to get. Even if you're wandering across Europe, it'd be difficult to put together that all these different museums are talking about the same thing. That it, uh, one of the things they were really into was liquor. They did a lot of drinking, as, as it turned out. But some of those jugs are uh, considerably bigger than taller than people and yeah they're huge and, and, and they said, made oh, this out is, of bronze this is and, probably um, full of me this is probably full yeah. of wine like yeah. wow that's it <laughs> but uh, i don't know no one told me that you know in terms of options for my funeral i could say i want a mound and a hundred gallons of wine <laughs> i want a bronze urn with hundred gallons of mead <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mead it was carry me <laughs> carry me through the afterlife <laughs> well they had a they had a different choice of what you uh, you know the egyptians had something that they thought they were going to get. But, uh, it just is like, I want to be buried with my cat. And the yeah. Celts were like, 100 gallons of wine. <laughs> 100 gallons. <laughs> so what have you been watching lately on Magellan TV? So one of the ones I watched recently was, uh, it's a series, and it's got a couple of episodes. It's called Ancient Inventions. Uh, the one I watched was the first episode, which talks about inventions of war. And the basic concept of it is to look at very modern stuff, and then kind of look at the precursors in the ancient world. Uh, it's hosted by Terry Jones, uh, who is of Monty Python fame. I He was also, I mean, like a medieval scholar, and he's, he's really interesting to watch, but he's also, I mean, he clearly knows what he's talking about. But one of the things they talked about is they found a, they found a body in the Alps uh, from 5,000 years ago, and it had a bow and arrows. And what they thought that was interesting about the arrows is that the, 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 the feathers were actually rifled on the back of it. And so that's, you know, that's something that we didn't start putting in guns until the, the, what, the 18th century, at least. And so it ends up talking about a lot of this stuff. And some of it's very, very surprising. It talks about uh, early flamethrowers defending Byzantium. It's, it's really interesting seeing how technology has evolved and how this ancient technology that you wouldn't necessarily think was connected to all kinds of stuff uh, really is connected to that. Yeah, so, you know, so it's, uh, a really, it's really interesting uh, stuff. Clever, you know, it's, it, people have always been clever. I, I, things were invented, I think, very much more than we realize, uh, uh, much more sophisticated than we would realize today. Yeah. 
And of course, if you are a listener or watcher of The History Guy, you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash historyguy, where we will always have a deal for you, sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership, or even a documentary that you can watch for free. Again, that's try.magellantv.com slash historyguy. Next up, the History Guy tells the long and winding story of ketchup. And stay tuned after the episode to hear us chat a little more with the History Guy. There is perhaps no condiment that is more quintessentially American than ketchup. It fills up entire aisles at grocery stores and adorns the tables of countless restaurants. And while a 2019 survey by Weber Grill said that sriracha hot sauce had surpassed ketchup as America's favorite condiment, ketchup would probably still win hands down if you asked the average American eight-year-old. Of course, ketchup does have its detractors, people who think it's bland or too sugary or just plain gross, and it is considered quite a faux pas, but ketchup on a Chicago-style hot dog. But despite its modern connections, ketchup wasn't invented in the United States, and for the vast majority of the history of ketchup, didn't have anything to do with tomatoes. The surprising history of the goopy red condiment deserves to be remembered. Ketchup's earliest origins take us back to Southeast Asia, and its ingredients were about as far from the condiment we know today as you can get. In the early 16th century, English traders in the East Indies came across a sauce called ketchup or kuchap, a fish sauce. The word likely has its roots in Southern Min, a language spoken by Chinese traders from the Hujian and Guangdong provinces, meaning preserved fish sauce, which would become ketchup in Malay or similar words in other Southeast Asian languages. Local recipes varied, but among the earliest is recorded in a Chinese text from 544. Take the intestine, stomach, and bladder of the yellow fish, shark, and mullet, and wash them well. Mix them with a moderate amount of salt and place them in a jar. Seal tightly and incubate in the sun. It will be ready in 20 days in summer, 50 days in spring or fall, and 100 days in winter. In the next centuries, soy and bean-based sauces became dominant in China, while fish sauces were popular further south. Fish sauces proliferated throughout the region, places like Thailand, Indonesia, and along the Mekong River, which transfers through modern Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Many recipes were centered around salted and fermented anchovies. Local sauces made of fermented fish still exist today, and in Indonesia, ketchup means sauce. It is less clear where British traders heard of the sauce. A 1732 recipe mentions Benkulu, a city in Sumatra, where the British East India Company established a presence by 1685. They might also have heard the word from southern men-speaking traders at any of their settlements. British merchant Charles Lockyer reported in his An Account of the Trade in India in 1711 of seeing huge numbers of Chinese trading ships throughout the region and that the best ketchup comes from Tonkin in northern Vietnam or China. As with many of the products England imported home, they very quickly made the product their own. One of the first things the English did from a recipe from 1736 was to add beer. The recipe calls for boiling down two gallons of strong stale beer and a half pound of anchovies, adding that the stronger and staler the beer, the better the ketchup will be. Eliza Smith's 1727 The Complete Housewife included a ketchup that had a pint of the best white wine vinegar and shallots, ginger, and mushrooms in addition to anchovies. A Jonathan Swift poem from three years later read, And for our homebred British cheer, Botargo, ketchup, and caviar. Early ketchups were made of all manner of things, such as cherries, oysters, blackberries, mushrooms, and even walnuts. For about a century, mushroom ketchups were popular in England, made by putting whole mushrooms in jars with salt. It is traditionally thin and almost black, and has been described as halfway between Worcestershire sauce and soy sauce, with, of course, undercurrents of mushroom. Ketchups of all kinds can vary significantly in consistency, from watery to the thick version more familiar to modern diners. Walnut ketchup was a favorite of Jane Austen. About the only thing that early ketchups weren't made of was tomatoes. Tomatoes are native to Western South America and were consumed by native populations in Central and South America before contact. The word tomato comes from the Aztec word tomatol. It isn't clear who first brought the plants to Europe. Cortes may have brought them when he returned from capturing Tenochtitlan in 1521, but Columbus may have brought specimens back as early as 1493. They were described in mid-16th century Italy and Spain, but were often grown for ornamental purposes. Still, they grew well in the Mediterranean, and over the next century became staples in Mediterranean cooking. Tomato came later to Northern Europe and to England by the 1590s, but it gained something of a negative reputation. 
One reason is that Europeans recognize the fruit as a relative of nightshade, the fruits are themselves similar to nightshade berries, which are extremely toxic. While tomatoes are a part of the same family, they are of course perfectly safe for consumption. Other nightshade family foods include eggplants, bell peppers, and chili peppers. The English botanist John Gerard authored The Herbal, or General History of Plants, in 1597. And while the work is largely a translation of earlier works, Gerard's work became the most prevalent English book on botany in the 17th century. While Gerard knew that tomatoes were eaten in Spain and Italy, he still declared them poisonous. His views were influential enough to steer many people away, even if they didn't think they were poisonous. Another possibility lies in a reaction between tomatoes and pewter. Pewter plates often had a relatively high lead content, and when brought into contact with it, highly acidic foods like tomatoes can leach the lead, possibly causing lead poisoning. Other English herbalists were skeptical of the plant as well. The botanist John Parkinson in 1629 called them love apples and said that while they were eaten in hotter climates, the English only grew them for curiosity and the beauty of the fruit. Another botanist, John Hill, mentioned that the English sometimes ate them in soups in 1754, but also that there are persons who think them not wholesome. Tomatoes did appear as ingredients in The Art of Cookery by Hannah Glass in 1758. They were growing in the Carolinas by 1710. One of the earliest appearances of tomato ketchup was in 1801, which is credited to Sandy Addison. Another early tomato ketchup recipe appears in an English book in 1817, which still included half a pound of anchovies and was included alongside walnut, mushroom, pudding, and oyster ketchups. James Meese invented a tomato ketchup in 1812, and Thomas Jefferson's cousin Mary Randolph included a tomato recipe in her 1824 cookbook, The Virginia Housewife. In 1834, Ohio physician John Cook Bennett took a different view of tomatoes. He declared that they were a panacea that could cure diarrhea, indigestion, jaundice, rheumatism, and could even prevent cholera. Bennett was a physician, known also for creating an early medical diploma mill. He sold medical degrees for $10 in the 1820s. Bennett encouraged everyone to eat tomatoes in any form, including ketchup, as they were the most healthy material in materia alimentary. Bennett claimed he had visited European hospitals that recommended tomatoes to healing patients, but even if he was lying, he wasn't the first to talk about the possible medical applications for the plant. Thomas Jefferson records that his friend, Dr. James Desequeria, thought if someone ate an abundance of these apples, they would never die. Other doctors in the early 1800s said tomatoes could cure headaches and were good against bilious diseases, and later many supported Bennett's conclusions. Bennett published his beliefs widely in American newspapers. Papers even began reporting that the tomato cure was working. In 1836, Archibald Miles, a seller of patent medicines, met Bennett, and shortly after began selling Dr. Miles' compact extract of tomato pills. The pills were so popular that imitations proliferated and even instigated a tomato pill war between Miles and a competitor, Guy Phelps, in the newspapers. Eventually, readers would learn that neither pill actually contained any tomato. Ketchup recipes in the early 1800s were either made at home or sold in small batches by local farmers. This changed by 1837, when Jonas Yerkes became possibly the first person to sell ketchup in bottles, by the quart and pint. Other manufacturers followed suit, but there were some problems with producing ketchup in large enough quantities to sell commercially. Tomatoes, especially in the north, had short growing seasons that required the preservation of tomato pulp that could be used year-round. With no regulation and a careless is typical of the age, bats of stored tomato pulp became infested with mold, yeast, spores, and bacteria. Cookbook author Pierre Blot described ketchups in 1866 as filthy, decomposed, and putrid. Some producers only made ketchup as a byproduct of tomato canning, using leftover pieces of tomato they sometimes swept off the floor. The ketchup was also often cooked in copper tubs, which could cause chemical reactions that made the condiment poisonous. Producers made up for these failings by filling their ketchups with preservatives like boric and salicylic acid and added coal tar to dye the yellowish stuff red. An 1896 study of commercial ketchups determined that over 90% of them contained injurious ingredients. Enter Henry J. Hines. Hines formed the Hines & Noble Company with a friend in 1860, first producing horseradish in clear bottles so consumers could see the quality of the product. He would later patent his now iconic octagonal glass bottle, which had a narrow neck to prevent air contact from discoloring the product. The company grew rapidly, but went bankrupt in the aftermath of the Panic of 1873. In 1876, he formed a new company, the F&J Heinz Company, with his brother and a cousin. And one of their first products was Heinz Ketchup, first introduced with the spelling Katsup, C-A-T-S-U-P. 
At the time, neither spelling was standard, but as a general rule in the 1800s, British imports used the term ketchup with a K, while domestic American brands preferred ketchup with a C. It is partially thanks to Heinz's decision to favor ketchup, K-E-T-C-H-U-P, spelling that would help it become the most prevalent spelling today. His ketchup was different from the get-go. While it did include some of the same preservatives and coal tar, Heinz had a goal of creating a consistent and quality product, and his use of elm bark helped to stabilize the product. His was also thicker than most ketchups of the time, and he took some inspiration from German ketchups, which combined sugar and vinegar to emphasize a sweet and sour mix of flavors. Modern ketchup increases its thickness by the addition of products like xanthan gum. Heinz says the ketchup must flow no faster than .028 miles per hour. Heinz was also remarkably kind to his workers, offering insurance, dining rooms, gymnasiums, and even an on-site manicurist. He opened his factory to public tours to tout its cleanliness. He felt that these aims would help public trust and ultimately benefit the business. At the turn of the century, Heinz saw opportunity in the numerous poor quality ketchups on the market if he could create a preservative-free ketchup, a product he gave to his chief food scientist, G.F. Mason. Mason's solution not only revolutionized the safety of ketchup, but the taste as well. His stable combination contained vinegar, sugar, and salt. The increased vinegar helped to protect the tomato from spoilage, and the recipe gave the product a new taste. Heinz's preservative-free ketchup was on the market by 1906, when he produced 5 million bottles of the stuff. The recipe had a downside, though, and made his ketchup 10 or 20 cents more expensive than his competitors. This, coupled with his desire to market Heinz as a leader in safe food manufacturing, led him to be a leader in support of the Food and Drug Act. Heinz's son Howard argued to President Roosevelt that though the regulation might cost companies money, it would inspire confidence in commercially prepared foods. The passage of the act and success of the Heinz company seems to have vindicated his strategy. Heinz ketchup has a 60% market share in the U.S. and greater in the U.K. For Americans, ketchup is almost an institution, an integral part of Fourth of July cookouts, partner to classic American foods and available freely in little packets at fast food restaurants. The military spent billions on ketchup to keep soldiers in the red stuff, which has come in handy for the sometimes less than appetizing meals that they have had to eat. Ketchup has even been to space. Perhaps no place symbolizes Americans' relationship with ketchup better than the world's largest ketchup bottle, a unique painted water tower built in 1949 next to a now-defunct ketchup bottling plant outside of Collinsville, Illinois. Despite its close relationship with Americans, tomato ketchup is enjoyed throughout the world, and the U.S. doesn't even necessarily eat the most per capita. In 2013, the U.S. was tied for fifth, behind the U.K., Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Canada. In Canada, Heinz bottles even had a recipe for ketchup cake on the back, which can only hope tastes better than it sounds. Of course, modern ketchup has a lot to owe to its history, but also a lot to Heinz, who helped establish the standard both for its flavor and its consistency. Ketchup is actually a non-Newtonian fluid, which means that its viscosity is variable based on applied force, and it has a unique shear thinning property to it, and that means when you hit the ketchup bottle, you actually reduce the viscosity of the ketchup, allowing it to flow more freely from the bottle, although that is, of course, an imperfect art. There is some disagreement over the best way to get ketchup out of the bottle, but Heinz himself suggested that you hit in the middle of the bottle right as the bottle begins to thin on the spot that said 57. And as to that 57, well, Heinz just made up that number because he thought it was catchy and lucky. It was inspired by an ad he saw for a shoe company that said they had 21 styles of shoes. But when he came up with the Heinz 57 brand, Heinz was already producing more than 60 products. Despite its pedestrian reputation, ketchup has a long history and still has a worldwide following, and it can be expected to continue to add flavor to the human experience well into the future. Ketchup is another one of those things that, you know, has a really American feeling these days and that you would you would you would say it has I mean that's the kind of stuff you'd probably find even in American Isles and other countries I bet there's ketchup but it's a one that has a history that is distinctly not American well, and much, well predates much older than you America think. though I mean it yeah. is when you think about it I mean what we talk about when we talk about ketchup there a lot of that stuff is nothing that you would think of as ketchup today that's uh, even that's true. where the name came from I mean, yeah you take a bunch of fish guts you put salt in there you seal it and leave it on your windowsill for four months <laughs> that's i mean and you can still get that's called fish sauce it's still actually quite popular in, in, in big chunks of the world but it's it's hard to think that that's where the name ketchup came from because that's not what you think of when you open up a bottle of you know Heinz. Or... well and, and and what the surprising thing to me is the fact that tomatoes are an, an afterthought 
Now, what you yeah. think about ketchup is, you know, it's tomato ketchup and so forth. But then when you watch the video and you realize that it was, uh, like he said, the inside of fish or whatever, whatever, the only thing that really was carried forward was the name. Was the name. Uh, Big well, Bad. I mean, there's a consistency and it's a condiment. But it's funny because I always used to laugh at a ketchup bottle because it would say tomato ketchup. I was like, of course it's yeah. tomato. You know, there's other kinds of, well, there what are. What else would it be? Literally, it was walnut ketchup and, and mushroom and ketchup. I, still some places where you can buy some of that that kind of stuff or in, in you know, fairly small batches. I don't know that uh, there's a whole lot of mushroom and walnut ketchup sold commercially these days. But, I mean, people do still eat some of those kinds of ketchups. And we have the... Uh, recipes for them but it is interesting it is amazing how a word that had you know nothing to do with what it means today was able to follow yeah. a product around over, uh, over uh, such know, a period of time it. and to, to become yeah. such a different uh, product yeah yeah completely different something yeah, i mean hey something... you know as far as i know uh, uh mushroom ketchup never made it into outer space i that's true i don't know i don't think so as far as i know they're not doing that or walnut ketchup or uh, any number of other kinds of ketchups that they made, but it's it is it is really interesting, and I I think that uh, it's it seems like you know at the time that they were more willing to let that word apply to lots of things, whereas today you know ketchup applies to a pretty specific range of things, and while you could make mushroom ketchup or something like that, uh, it would if you said ketchup, no one's gonna no one's gonna think of anything but tomatoes. But these tomatoes days. these days, yeah, it's kind and of I, interesting yeah. how, how it became that. I would be willing to bet that there's not anybody that we're talking to today, as they're listening to our podcast, that doesn't have a big bottle of ketchup, um, uh, and that's one of the things they talk about often is should you put it in the refrigerator or should you leave it on the shelf. Mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't, yeah. if we, if that's yeah. the most serious thing that we have to decide these days, I keep mine in the refrigerator, but, uh, but, babe, but it is, it is, okay. it I is think, about as universal as anything. I think ketchup says anything. refrigerate, I think it does, doesn't it? I don't know. I, uh, they they say sure. one way or the other. But, but I mean, mustard has vinegar in it, so I mean, it, it, might, it might not need to, but, uh, but yeah. yeah ketchup has some vinegar in it too, and you know, they, they talked about that that was part of why uh, in the video, you know, the getting that perfect preservative, they to get the preservatives out if you put enough vinegar in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that you could balance things out. Yeah, it is interesting to hear about it was you know how the tomatoes were rotting and stuff inside of ketchup. And then <laughs> there's a, there's a chunk of the history of tomato ketchup that that, that really is pretty uh, distasteful there. You know, and they're, and they're putting colors <laughs> yeah. in it to hide that it's turning funny colors on its own. And yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, that's, there's a lot of food history that's like that. You know, regulation was was pretty dicey, and people were getting used yeah. to what ketchup was. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, it is. I mean, it's 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 fascinating that it has such an ancient history, but also the the relatively modern history of how that turned into something in the U.S. when people at first weren't even using tomatoes and how it turned into the yeah. product that now almost everybody has. Uh, although there is a statistic in that video saying that, uh, at least by this one survey, that people now prefer sriracha yeah. hot sauce to ketchup. I wonder... I feel like there was, and I, I don't know, this I could be totally off on this. I'm not really a fan of sriracha myself. Uh, uh, I wonder if it, it was kind of a fad, and I wonder if that's fallen off some or if, or if I don't know. I, 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 you know, I don't know. And of course, that was just one survey. But I mean, I, I yeah. would think, uh, maybe I'm old, but I would think that many more people have a bottle of ketchup in their house than have a bottle of sriracha. Well, and how could you eat a French fry without it? Yeah, so the, the, Seriously. the great number of restaurants uh, in America still essentially routinely have ketchup at the tables. Yeah. I do think it's funny on the mo on the modern ketchup ta uh, bottles. Uh, you know, if you buy it at the store, it'll probably be clear still, and although made of plastic and not glass. But you know, the whole the whole concept of making it clear was that you could see that it wasn't you know Doesn't come bad, yeah. rotting. Uh, and now at most at most restaurants, they'll have uh, they'll have opaque bottles. And I think it's because honestly, you know, it's kind of gross to see the the very <laughs> ketchup ketchup doesn't is a weird consistency and so it looks a little gross to have a half thing of ketchup it is so well i think it, actually but... too if the sun gets to the food it actually the the, the food oh, really? degrades more quickly yeah that's uh, uh see and that's not a problem in my in the house because uh, you're going to keep that someplace where it's probably not in direct sunlight yeah that's 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 an interesting one i hadn't thought of that i did you know i think i forget sometimes all the stuff that came to europe from the Colombian exchange uh, some of the stuff, tomatoes seem like such a key part of, you know, Mediterranean cuisine mm -hmm. that I feel like it's so easy to be like, oh, there were just always tomatoes instead of, you know, tomatoes are actually like a, a very modern, yeah, yeah. A very recent thing that came to Europe well, and, and the, the, the Italians took it. Considered dangerous. Uh, basically, yeah. the reason that it was, uh, you know, discovered, but uh, but then they went on and didn't use them for so many years because they 
because it was a very it's of the nightshade yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a... it's funny to me when we it, that part of the video when i when i was doing the research for this episode because we mentioned it some but there was more uh where they're like oh we know that they eat it in italy but like this is probably poisonous like maybe <laughs> those italians are just <laughs> Uh, and, and it took so long, but it's hard to imagine growing uh, tomatoes as as like a, you just you want a tomato plant because you're like oh it's pretty as opposed yeah, to they're flowers or, ornamental yeah. yes yeah ornamental ornamental tomatoes the blossoms is, is are not little... that pretty so... yeah and these these days uh, it'd be crazy to to have it like tomato plants are you know not exactly the gorgeous kind of plants they're they're the working plant. <laughs> Yeah, 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 we don't generally grow ornamental tomatoes. Yeah. Somebody probably does, but yeah, that's not the usual. I also thought, I mean, you know, we talked about how it intertwines with this history of uh, of safe food. But ultimately, I mean, we kind of have a lot to catch up in terms of our <laughs> the Heinz supporting the, you know, the FDA was uh, or the, the the food and the Food and Drug Act, yeah, uh, was was a big deal. Uh, and that's that's the kind of stuff that we you don't necessarily see. And yeah, you yeah, I mean, you, think, you, know, you barely think of ketchup, and, uh, is, and, and instead of thinking that ketchup was, you know, changing history and changing yeah. culture and made food safer. And I mean, there's a reason that we have it, you know, as an almost universal condiment. And, you know, again, when we find this food history, it's at first it sounds kind of trivial. Uh, you know, uh, it's just what we eat. But then you think about it. I mean, there's there's not much that is more integral to culture than what you eat. Uh, and it's amazing how much a role that so many of these types of foods have played uh, in in our whole evolution of culture and, and evolution of important events in history. Yeah, absolutely. And Heinz, I mean, he was he was a unique person, someone who was not just, you know, changing how we how we took care of food and making sure that he had good food because clearly there were quite a few people who were willing to uh sell ketchup that they probably knew wasn't safe yeah and it, it required a personality who tomato was tomato leavings to say, they swept up off the floor yeah 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 well and we've we've seen we've seen that kind of stuff in a lot of in a lot of videos uh, when we did the uh, the olive poisoning video you you found out that you know these olives were similar to ketchup i mean what being left in vats and stuff like that that was not necessarily kept uh perfectly sealed or anything and they just kept selling it out of it anyway so they could sell it you know outside of the tomato season and that's uh, that's it's disturbing i mean that's that's the kind of stuff that you hear we are like oh that's why we have regulations is because people were willing to do that someone was someone was uh, unscrupulous enough to do that but it is interesting that you know you could owe that kind of stuff to something that uh, is so otherwise commonplace and kind of unsung because mm -hmm. right, you're right you don't think that much of ketchup because it's just it's so every day yeah, and I think people generally think their ketchup's safe. I mean, that's uh, all right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's the symbol that it is now because you have to understand that it wasn't always. Yeah. Yeah. So I did think I wanted to ask whether if you guys like ketchup or not, which sometimes that's a, <laughs> there's some strong opinions on, on ketchup being, you know, a, a trashy, trashy condiment or not. You know, it depends. Well, first of all, this is very strange, uh, but this is something that we ate when I was a kid is that we would eat ketchup with ham. Uh, and still yeah. sometimes when I have cold ham, I slice it and eat it with ketchup. Uh, uh, but uh, and uh, sometimes I know this will make people upset. But sometimes when I have a hot dog, I will put ketchup on it, ketchup and mustard. Admit, and we'll, we'll mix. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I, I just I pretty much never ketchup. eat a, a hamburger that I don't put ketchup on. Well, and I just yeah. ate a big pile of French fries for lunch. Uh, we both had to take a nap afterwards. <laughs> and uh, and of course, the first thing I looked was where's the ketchup bottle? But they brought it to us in a little cup. Yeah, so I mean, I would say, I mean, I, I, I don't, I mean, uh, this is, I, uh, you know, my mother's part of the beef industry, and we've done episodes on steaks too. I would never put ketchup on a steak. I uh, hope not. Oh goodness, you, you know, I hope better not. Me either. Uh, and I would know enough just because I know people that if I were to eat a hot dog in Chicago, even if I want to ketchup, I wouldn't ask for it. Uh, but I mean, I think, yeah, there's, I mean, there's definitely always a bottle of ketchup in my refrigerator, and uh, I, I guess I do refrigerate it. And, uh, mm -hmm. this, is, this is what I would do, and uh, uh, and there are certainly things that I would always routinely eat with ketchup. It's a little funny, you know. My, me and my brother were always. I mean, we ate lots of ketchup. Jacob, my brother, was famous for for eating stuff with ketchup. I think he probably has eaten steak uh, with ketchup, and I I don't remember doing that, but maybe I did too as a kid. Uh, as a kid, you eat ketchup with anything. I swear, but uh, my wife Cassidy hates ketchup. Oh, <laughs> she's, she, she she hates it. She can't uh, she can't stand the smell. It honestly is a sacrifice for her to let me eat ketchup. <laughs> she's she's much more of a, a mustard person. But it's uh, it's a little funny to me that she's not really big on tomatoes in general. But yeah, she's just ketchup is one of those things that she bothers like, her. Oh, that's disgusting. Well, yeah, we've done but an which, episode on mustard as well, so we'll have to put that yeah. into another podcast.
<laughs> something something that Cassidy will eat. Yeah, she is <laughs> she is not a I I've never met some well, that's not true. I had one friend that was that bad on ketchup. He was like, if there is ketchup on he if he he would always ask for no ketchup and if they put any kind of ketchup on the burger, there was no way for him to eat it then because you couldn't you can't clean off the the apparently the stank of ketchup. <laughs> well, when I fix a hamburger at my house, I put mustard on one side of the bun and ketchup on the other. Ketchup on the other, yeah. <laughs> I, so, but I, mean, I, 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 you know, I think if you did a poll, many more Americans uh, like ketchup than don't like ketchup. But I, you know, yes. you're right, especially when you're a kid. I mean, you might put ketchup in anything. I mean, if I've heard of where people put ketchup in macaroni and cheese. Uh, and, uh, uh, it, you, know, that's, you know, that's not what I've done with it. But I certainly have foods yeah. that I eat. There's always a ketchup bottle involved. Well, and I, I think that most people with children are quite used to putting lots of ketchup. It's one of those things, you know, we talked about the the kind of it doesn't it's not a terribly strong flavor it's got it doesn't have crazy textures ketchup again is really kind of a one note strong yeah, strong, strong flavor and i mean it's kind of got that sweet and sour thing going on too but it's it's able to have a, a flavor that's not terribly uh it's not te well it's not terribly complex it's uh yes. and so so yeah when you're as your palate's developing you know then uh, maybe anything that's challenging your palate is, is better with, with ketchup mm -hmm. thank you for listening to this episode of the history guy podcast we hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.